welcome everyone to today's webinar on Red Plus. And we cannot have a webinar on Red Plus without our head of nature-based solutions. So today we're joined by Teresa Bodner, as well as our senior geo special analyst, Julia Mollist, who will explain some of our geo special touch uh, on assessing some of the Red Plus projects. And as we deep dive into uh, integrity of this project type, we have today with us um, Head of Carbon Projects and Integrity Analysis, Tristan Loeffler, as well as our Carbon Credit Integrity Analyst, Luke Martindale. And very special today, we have our partner from Cloris Geospatial, Marco Albany, CEO and co-founder of Cloris Geospatial, would share with us today um, carbon stock assessment uh, using geospatial technique. As usual, um, the webinar will be recorded and uh, participants will be automatically muted, but we do encourage you to put your question in the Q&A chat box and we will select some of the question to answer at the end of the presentation. Uh, the recording and the slides will be available on our website by the end of this week, and you will be able to share them with your colleagues. So not to lose any more time, I will hand over to Tristan to walk us through that presentation today. So over to you, Tristan. Thanks, Sam. Um, and as Sam said, we, ha we have a real packed agenda today, and we're, we're really looking forward to talking to you about the topic of Red Plus. Just a quick overview on the agenda, we're going to talk a bit about the history of Red Plus and um, how it's grown as a category within the carbon markets. We're then going to dive into some of the key opportunities and controversies and try to unpick those debates and then provide a bit more of a forward looking assessment on what's ahead and potential solutions to some of the controversies we talk about. Um, and we will leave some time for a QA and a at the end, but as Am said, please post any questions as we go on the chat. Just quickly, I won't go through this in too much detail, given I, hopefully a lot of you are aware of what we do at MSCI Carbon Markets. Really, we provide institutional grade data analytics and insights across the whole of the carbon markets. And really, what we try to do is answer key questions that different stakeholders have. So that might be in terms of how new policies and guidance affect corporate climate action and the use of carbon credits which companies are setting climate targets, how many credits are they buying, how many will they need in the future, what type of carbon credits are being created and used today, and how will this change in the future, which credits have the highest integrity and greatest protection from reputational risk. And then on the right-hand side, in terms of pricing, how much do carbon credits cost today and how have, that, how have those prices changed, and a forecasting forward-looking version of that to in terms of how will supply, demand, price of carbon credits change in the future? Specific to Red Plus, there's clearly, we provide data on Red Plus across all of those categories. So whether it's policy and regulation regarding Red Plus in our policy module, whether it's information on the price of Red Plus credits and our forecasting of those prices, or whether it's on the integrity side, which we're going to primarily focus on today. But all of this information can be found on the Carbon Markets platform. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Teresa to talk a bit about the history of Red Plus. Brilliant. So if you are here today, undoubtedly, you know, we don't have to hammer on this on very long. You're aware of the importance of Red Plus. Since 2001, we've had 2.7 billion tonnes of CO2 emissions from deforestation, equivalent to the annual fossil fuel emissions of India. And as you can see in the chart here, over those 20 years, this trend has unfortunately been increasing and not decreasing. Now, protecting these forests is truly crucial, not only on the climate front, but also on others. Forests can provide 30% of the solution to keeping global warming below 2%. 2 degrees Celsius, even though parts of the Amazon are already working towards very critical tipping points. But it's about more than just the climate. Over 1.6 billion people depend on forests for food and fuel, and 70 million people worldwide call forests their home. So Red Plus is not only important and it's critical, it also already comes with quite a bit of history. Back in 2001, there was the Marrakesh Accords that excluded deforestation projects from the CDA, um, as well as additional work from Costa Rica and Papua New Guinea to propose RED at COP11. 
Then there is 2007, a very important year. Amongst other things, we had the introduction of the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility and the UN Red, Red Program, as well as a billion dollars in US funding from Norway going towards Brazil for Red. In the 2010s, Vera registered their first Red Plus project and the Warsaw Framework increased support for result-based payments. The Paris Agreement included Red Plus in Article 5, and in the most recent years, we're looking at ART, who started working on and subsequently launched the jurisdictional Red Plus standard. There was the, the Glasgow Declaration of Forests, of course, and last but not least, the LEAF Coalition's commitment to invest over 1 billion US dollars, I think it's 1.5 billion at this point, into JRED credits. So RED has a lot of history and it's very important, but not every RED project is the same as the other one. There is one important distinction, for example, that's based on their level of national coordination. On the one end of the spectrum, you have standalone RED Plus projects, which are the most common one in the market right now. You're looking at private developers, local baselines, and no or a limited coordination between the projects. Then you're looking at jurisdictionally aligned RED Plus, where you still have local projects, but they now use jurisdictional baselines. We'll be getting back to this particular type of projects later in the webinar. As the national coordination increases, you then move to nested RED, where local RED Plus projects are nested within jurisdictional RED Plus programs run by governmental developers. And these so-called JRED, jurisdictional RED Plus programs, constitute then the other side of the spectrum, because now you have governmental developers, governmental departments or whole governments managing areas that cover whole jurisdictions, may even cover whole nations. In our webinar today, we'll focus on the left side of the spectrum, but we will, we will mention jurisdictional RED Plus wherever it does apply. The other way to classify RED Plus projects is based on their deforestation threat, which can be planned or unplanned. If you want to avoid unplanned deforestation, you want to reduce deforestation caused by highly localized agents. Think uh, local communities, for example. And these communities don't have the right to carry out these activities that cause the deforestation in the first place. So the deforestation you're looking at is gradual, but persistent. It happens over a long period of time. And these projects that focus on unplanned deforestation are also a lot more common in the VCM at the moment. On the other hand, if you want to avoid planned deforestation, you want to prevent usually large scale commercial agents from exercising their legal right to cut down the forest as they had planned. So they had the right to do it. And now with the project, you can prevent this from happening. In this case, obviously the deforestation looks differently. The deforestation you would expect happens over a much shorter, shorter time frame, say five to 10 years, and would be much more intense. Whichever way you want to look at Red Plus projects, putting them all together as a whole in the VCM, issuances from Red Plus projects have grown rapidly since 2016, reaching 346 million tons of CO2 equivalent in 2023 by a total of 116 registered and issuing projects. All the registered projects, as well as the 190 pipeline Red Plus projects, in terms of like where they are around the globe, they cover all kinds of tropical forests all over the world. The registered projects alone cover 0 0.6 million, 600,000 hectares of forest and store 99 billion tons of CO2 equivalent, which by the way, is like over two and a half times the world's annual fossil fuel emissions. So we're not, we're not talking peanuts here and it definitely demonstrates the amount of CO2 stored in these forests. Before we enter the actual sort of deep dive going into them in a lot more detail, I do wanna mention what, what about Red Plus prices. So Red Plus prices in the VCM have historically been high, but they have been declining recently, not least due to macroeconomic reasons, pressures, as well as the heightened Red Plus scrutiny, which particularly happened in the last year, of course. So we put here a bit of a comparison. In the fourth quarter of 2022, average Red Plus prices were $10.70 versus market average of $6.80. One year later, Red Plus prices have dropped 45% to $5.60, whereas the market average price only dropped 25% to $4.90. Thanks, Teresa. So before we discuss some of the key challenges that have led to this scrutiny and decline in prices, it's worth reiterating the benefits of Red Plus as a concept. Really by channeling finance to areas most at risk of deforestation, 
and then targeting those agents and drivers of deforestation in a localized way, there are a number of benefits that these projects can produce. On the environmental side, clearly by protecting areas of high carbon stock and high biodiversity value, these projects really can deliver very tangible environmental benefits. But the benefits don't stop there. And on the economic side, there are also potential benefits of these projects by providing an alternative livelihood for communities outside of activities linked to deforestation. And in this way, by providing these economic incentives outside of deforestation activities, Red Plus projects can create long-term sustainable economic development. This economic development is even further accentuated by some institutional benefits that can exist in these projects. By improving governance processes and investing in infrastructure, again, Red Plus projects do have the potential to enhance and set communities up for further development going forwards. So despite these clearly very valuable benefits, why has there been so much recent scrutiny on Red Plus? And it comes down to really challenges that exist across the full spectrum of integrity criteria that within the MSCI Carbon Marks Integrity team we consider. And there are two primary types of challenges here. Firstly, measurement ones, and secondly, design and operation challenges. And let's take measurement challenges first. To accurately calculate the emissions impact of a Red Plus project, it is inherently difficult and requires a number of complex steps. Challenges exist in estimating what would have happened in the baseline scenario, measuring how much carbon exists in a forest, accounting for the fact that deforestation might leak to other areas outside of the project area, and also compensating for future reversal risks from both natural and human-based causes. And we'll now go through a few of these key topics in turn now. And the first and maybe the most contentious of these measurement challenges is in terms of baselines. In Red Plus, to accurately measure the project's impact in terms of the emission reductions that they avoid or reduce, projects have to estimate how much deforestation would have occurred without the project. And this requires projects thinking about a counterfactual baseline scenario through which they can evaluate how much deforestation would have occurred and therefore how much has been avoided or reduced. And clearly if projects overestimate how much deforestation would have occurred, then they're overestimating the amount of emission reductions that they're generating. And this is really where a lot of the Red Plus debate has focused on. And it's a very contentious issue with two very opposing sides of the debate. On the proponent side, there are some actors that argue that baselines closely match observed data, and therefore overestimation of baselines has been very low. While the detractors argue that actually baselines have been heavily overestimated, meaning that many projects and not reducing the amount of emissions that they're claiming. So what leads to this very different view of the proponents and detractors? And it really comes down to what you compare the baseline predictions of a project against. For the proponents, they're comparing the baseline prediction of projects to the observed deforestation at a more jurisdictional level therefore sort of assuming this jurisdictional average is representative of the project area. For the detractors though, they're comparing the project's baseline deforestation prediction against a more local control region. And that control region is meant to match the individual characteristics of the project area. And by doing that, they're claiming that observed deforestation in these control regions is far below the deforestation rate predicted by projects. So clearly a lot of this debate comes down to what you're comparing the project's baseline to and how you're using this concept of reference regions to estimate what the baseline deforestation rate would have been, which we'll now go into more detail on. As you just heard from Tristan, at the core of every Red Plus project lies the baseline. And here I want to take the opportunity to briefly introduce three major concepts, reference regions, baselines and emission reduction. 
as well as how these are interconnected. As you might already be aware, in the making of an unplanned Red Plus project, the project developers have the challenge of selecting a reference region. Reference regions, also known as counterfactual, uh, are areas subject to similar deforestation threats as the project area. The deforestation rate within the reference region then is used uh, to calculate the project baseline. We will go into more detail on how this calculation can be done in a couple of minutes. Uh, baseline represents uh, business as usual scenarios, meaning that they estimate what would have happened to a forest without uh, the carbon project. Um, we went through the concept of reference regions and baselines. Now, how are these uh, used for calculating emission reduction? Uh, simply enough, emission reduction um, are calculated from the difference between the baseline deforestation rate and the deforestation within the project area itself. Now that we covered our basis, I would like to take you through three of the main challenges that affect the selection of a reference region. So as we just said, uh, when looking for a reference region, we want an area with similar conditions to the project area that is a similar deforestation risk. And here comes the first core challenge, representativeness. Selecting a suboptimal region that is a reference region that does not share the same characteristic as the project area might uh, mislead us to over or underestimate uh, the baseline. On the screen now, you can see an illustrative example where the reference region defined by the project is not fully representative of the project area. Uh, there is char some characteristics of the project area are found in the reference region, whilst other aren't. Uh, in alignment with the market direction, at MSCI, we developed a, a likeness score uh, to measure for representativeness. This score is based uh, on a selection of characteristics that are linked to deforestation. So for both project and reference region, we extract these characteristics. These are elevation, forest cover and loss, distance to forest edges, population density, slope and biome. And from this, we compute our likeness score. But our approach doesn't stop uh, with assessing the representativeness of an existing reference region. Uh, again, in line with the industry standards, uh, we develop a dynamic baseline model um, to find the most likely uh, areas to become uh, the most likely areas that to become representative reference region within a confined scoping region. Uh, and here comes the second challenge uh, that we address in our approach selective bias. The risk of bias increases when a reference region is defined in a manual and subjective matter. Uh, we address this issue when uh, developing our dynamic reference region. The representation is uh, granted by using the six characteristics I shared previously, uh, while the bias is accounted for thanks to our pre-trained machine learning models. Uh, additionally, we select a multitude of areas. We are not only focusing on one. Um, these areas have to be highly similar to the project area, and all these areas will contribute to our dynamic reference region. Uh, a third challenge that we want to talk about today is the dynamic, this is the backward uh, looking approach on the topic of baseline. Uh, let us imagine a fictitious project starting its conservation activities in 2009. And let's track historical deforestation in the reference region. A classic approach for defining the baseline consists in calculating the average deforestation over the 10 years prior to the beginning of the project, and this would be the historical baseline. This backward looking approach uh, risks of not considering the ever changing conditions of the region and its trend. So with this challenge in mind, um, I would like to take you through a, the MSCI approach on going from reference region uh, to baseline. After selecting uh, several reference regions, as we were, say as we were saying before, um, that we consider adequate based on the criteria exposed, uh, we measure the deforestation rate over these regions together with an uncertainty bound. We are always tracking uncertainty in our pro uh, process. So starting from historical deforestation, we make dynamic forward-looking estimates 
on future deforestation risk. Uh, this is done by using three main approaches. The traditional approach consists, again, in averaging out the deforestation rate over the 10 years prior to the project start and extrapolating it as a future deforestation risk. A second dynamic baseline is then estimated uh, by linearly interpolating the historical trend and extrapolating it into the future. Lastly, uh, whenever a project has been running for a sufficient number of years, we also measure deforestation post project start up to the most up to date uh, year from our geospatial data sets. And from that, we extract our third uh, dynamic baseline. Thanks, Julia. So, so what are the results from this approach that we take that really aim to tackle some of these key challenges regarding reference regions? I think the first thing to say is that we really believe talking about this debate in terms of what percent of red plus credits are over or underestimated is fundamentally wrong. This isn't a binary issue and there's too much variation at the individual project level. And our findings at the individual project level are more nuanced than this. As shown in this distribution chart, our findings reveal that for nearly 50% of Red Plus projects, their baseline deforestation rates do appear significantly outside a reasonable range, and there is high risk of baseline overestimation. What this means is for buyers, if they want to achieve a one ton reduction impact, they would have to buy multiple credits from these projects to do so. However, it should be said, there are many projects whose baseline rates do appear within a reasonable range of outcomes. Nearly 20% of projects use a baseline rate that has lower risk of overestimation. Though only very few of these, we would consider them very conservative. So this variation at the individual project level is important and illustrates how any phrasing of the baseline argument with just aggregate statistics fails to acknowledge the nuance that exists at the individual project level and those projects that are creating their baselines in a lower risk way. Baselines is only one part of our Red Plus assessments. There are actually 24 main topics that we evaluate in detail at the individual project level as part of our integrity assessments. Geospatial data is crucial across the spectrum of these topics, as well as the baseline analysis presented by Julia in terms of validating carbon stock, assessing leakage, measuring future permanence risks, and also evaluating the biodiversity impacts of projects, geospatial data plays an important role. And while much of this is done in-house by our, our geospatial team, for carbon stock validation, we have partnered with Cl Chloris Earth, who we believe are a leading global provider of biomass data. And I'm very pleased to say that today we have Marco, the CEO and co-founder of Chloris, joining us on this webinar to talk about this topic of biomass estimation in more detail and how Chloris tries to tackle it. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, great to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. So at Chloris, we, we are a science-based technology company that produces estimation, direct estimation of biomass in vegetation from remote sensing data. And we believe this is the necessary revolution that is coming to measuring for, forest carbon stock at scale. Today, much of the industry uses late 20th century tech. It basically uh, assesses changes in land cover, so in forest area, uh, rather than actually directly measuring changes in carbon stored in vegetation. And then there are changes in carbon stored in vegetation by the changes in forest area. The um, Availability of Earth observation data now at everybody's fingertip, which has been one of the things that changed in the early uh, part of this century, has made that possible. A lot of the analysis that the uh, that has driven this controversy around Red Plus, and this analysis is largely driven on global open data assessment of deforestation. Now that approach has one pretty big limitation, which is that it's based on definition of forest areas that can be arbitrary and not fully reflect what is happening on the ground. What you have in this slide, for example, 
is a map of the infamous Cariba Red Plus project, a portion of it, shown as a takeover map with 10% canopy density as threshold from Global Forest Watch, and then with 20% canopy density as the threshold. And uh, as anyone who has used remote sensing product knows, the difference between 10% and 20% canopy density measured from remote sensing is really, really hard to get right. So we have this massive difference in perspective of what is forest, what is not forest from this kind of approach in areas where it would be very important that we actually monitor what's happening. And Earth observation and the launch of a whole uh, suit of active sensor has now made it possible to measure directly biomass. And measuring directly biomass provides you with a very uh, much more stable view of what is the state of vegetation and then able makes you uh, able to track it over time. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you how this technology works. Basically, it's a combination of active sensors, a rather sen a lighter sensors that are in space and they're measuring the vertical structure of the uh, forest, convert that into biomass using a lometric equation, which is pretty much exactly what people do in the field. They take a measurement and estimate biomass from a lometric equation, then use uh, advances in machine learning and in uh, uh, cloud computing so that we can use a massive amount of imagery and turn that into a wall-to-wall -wall annual estimate of biomass stock, biomass change. And then from there, one can also derive forest cover and forest cover changes and come up with a deforestation versus degradation view of the world. But that is actually derived from a forest carbon estimates and not done by first detecting the forestation degradation event and then turning that into a carbon stock and change uh, estimate. So it's really a Copernican revolution how you look at the dynamics of, of carbon in vegetation and allows you to see both degradation and forest growth and large stand replacement events. How can you use that or how the, the team at MSCI uses that for uh, Red Plus integrity assessment is fundamentally three main use cases. One, it's possible to use the stock maps to validate the project assumptions about the density of carbon in the forest. And that involves both looking at the average number, but also looking at the uh, sampling strategy and the choice of um, data because the projects don't use direct biomass estimation. They generally use field data or literature numbers in actually estimating the carbon value of the forest that is lost or with what, what, uh, the one that is not lost, so the one that generates the credit. There's another big dimension, which is all these forests that are not cut down, in some cases, in fact, in many cases, are actually continuing to sequester carbon. They're increasing their carbon stock over time. And detecting that with this technology allows you to understand the benefit that the atmosphere gets from continued forest preservation that is currently uncredited, but is a service that these projects provide. Finally, this is the big thing that most projects today don't do. RDD stands for reduced emission from deforestation and degradation. Most projects don't measure degradation today, don't have protocols to measure degradation. Direct carbon estimation allows you to measure degradation understand whether degradation is actually being avoided or not, whether there was degradation in the baseline that is now being avoided, whether a project is instead seeing a lot of degradation that is not captured by a land cover view of the world. So these are the main uses that you can use this data for. We're not the only one producing this data. This data is now produced by multiple providers and really should be integrated in the, in the standards. That's, a, that's our position. Thank you so much for having me here and getting back to our colleagues at MSCI. Thanks a lot, Marco. And as Marco said, there's a few different use cases for how we use the information from Chlorosurf to validate carbon stock in a number of different ways. 
that's a crucial component that feeds into how we assess this criteria around quantification for Red Plus projects. But as well as that geospatial data, it's worth saying that um, there are other factors that go into this quantification assessment. So we do assess whether the project themselves have used best practice approaches to sampling or the use of allometric equations. And secondly, we also evaluate the concept of leakage and where, to what extent leakage risks have been appropriately mitigated and accounted for by the project. We don't have time to go into leakage in detail in this webinar, but it's worth mentioning this is, can be a significant risk. So as shown on the right-hand side, many Red Plus projects actually do achieve a very high quantification score on average, indicating high likelihood that they have accurately measured their emissions impact accurately, assuming that the baseline scenario is correct. But as you see, there's clearly a wide distribution here in the scores. The last criteria we look at within emissions impact integrity is permanence. Clearly the forest is protected from deforestation, but that forest is then deforested or lost due to natural human causes in 20 years time. The project's impact has only been a transitory one. And so to fully evaluate this risk of reversal, we assess permanence in three main steps. Firstly, what is the significance of different natural and human factors that might lead to reversals in the future. Secondly, to what extent have projects successfully mitigated some of these risks based on their activities? And thirdly, to what extent is the project's buffer pool contribution sufficient to compensate for this net permanence risk? For more analysis on buffer pools, MSCI subscribers can find our recent detailed report on buffer pools on the Carbon Markets Intelligence site. And so in terms of natural permanence risk, there are five main types that we look at. Four is shown here are fire, tropical cyclone, drought and heat and landslide. And then for the US, we also assess biotic risks such as insect outbreaks. And we use a combination of remote sensing data, process-based modeling and machine learning to translate all of those impacts into the biomass lost over a project lifespan. So this allows us to estimate at the individual project level what percent risk of reversal do you expect from these natural risks? So although natural risks are an important consideration for Red Plus projects, on average, human-based risks do tend to be more do tend to be more significant. For Vero projects, two-thirds of its permanence risks comes from these human factors. Human permanence risks include both internal and external factors. Projects with the lowest risk will be based in countries with a strong and clear rural land use ownership rights, free from any local land or land use rights disputes, have secured lengthy legally binding commitments, and are typically located in areas where the project creates lower opportunity costs. This last point does mean that projects do typically avoid areas suitable for industrialised commercial plantations where the opportunity cost is particularly high. Although the median project contribution to each of these individual components is low in some cases, uh, total project uh, permanence contributions can reach 20%, a figure that typically mitigates much of the total risk. Fundamental to the success of a Red Plus project is ensuring that the project benefits outweigh the opportunity costs for the landowners and the communities. Without this, the permanence risks facing a project are much greater. To evaluate the size of the opportunity cost at MSCI, we conduct geospatial opportunity cost modeling based on the relevance and significance of 27 commodities at the individual project level. We can see a few illustrations of this on the left-hand side of the slide. It's then crucial that the project benefits outweigh these costs to ensure that the community is incentivized to maintain the project activities. Projects vary in how they choose to provide these benefits, but we can see from the graphic on the right, the most common mechanism is through providing agricultural support training. To best demonstrate the way in which Red Plus projects are predicated upon fully compensating the opportunity cost, we can have a look through this short matrix. Along the top, we have the proportion of a credit sale price spent on compensating locals, for example, through agroforestry projects or health support, and along the left, the price at which the credit is sold for. If the opportunity cost for a project was $15 per credit, a project sharing, say, 80% of its revenue with locals would need to uh, sell its credits for almost $19 each in order to fully compensate uh, local opportunity costs at these levels. 
Some uh, given some academic studies have indicated web plus opportunity costs on average center around the $15 per credit mark. Um, so this really illustrates the importance of achieving both higher prices and ensuring a larger share of these revenues reach the impacted communities. With the majority of our plus projects sharing less than 40% of uh, revenue, and revenue and current prices sitting below $6, uh, fully compensating uh, this cost is often an exceedingly difficult challenge. Plan Vivo registry has particularly stringent benefit sharing requirements, mandating that at least a market leading 70% of revenue is to be shared with local communities. However, from the chai, it's clear that it's very difficult for even these Plan Vivo projects to fully compensate locals at current prices. We can then actually view many of the integrity risks facing bad plus projects through the lens of this opportunity cost differential, as if, on average, benefits to all stakeholders do not fully compensate the costs. Many of the projects will only remain viable if the emission reductions they generate are in some way inflated, not permanent, or the project allows net negative social and or economic impact. Despite these risks, when we compare the project's buffer contributions to MSCI's model permanence risk, we can see that many Red Plus projects do appear to sufficiently compensate for the permanence risk they face. Given this, over 50% of Red Plus projects have a permanent score higher than four, indicating low risk of reversals. Red Plus projects actually score on average higher than AAR and IFM projects when it comes to their permanent scores. Although there is, of course, a lot of variation within Red Plus as a project type, uh, as we can see from the outliers at the top of the chart on the left hand side, which show the buffer pool contributions, which show when buffer con pool contributions are significantly less than our model with estimates of the risk. As well as the measurement and structural challenges we have discussed up to this point, it's always important to acknowledge the design challenges that face per plus projects as well. Uh, the way in which a project is designed not only impacts the emission impact, such as permanence, but also social, economic, also the social, economic, and ecological effect of a project or we call co-benefits. The provision of alternative livelihoods in a strong stakeholder consultation process are essential, not just to minimizing permanence risks, as described earlier, but also in supporting these co-benefits. Co-benefits is a broad term that incorporates a number of different types of potential benefits. When analyzing Red Plus projects, we primarily evaluate co-benefits across four main topics, alternative livelihoods, diversity and inclusion, education, health and infrastructure, and biodiversity. Due to some of the issues mentioned in the permanent section, on average, Red Plus projects lead, like, lead to likely net negative impacts on alternative livelihoods and ensuring project impacts are equitable and inclusive. Projects that share a significant proportion of revenue with locals place a strong emphasis on promoting sustainable alternative employment sources and ensure these benefits are most targeted at the lower income households or disadvantaged groups will be most likely to actually generate a positive impact in these areas. However, Red Plus projects do typically have positive impacts on health, uh, education and infrastructure, as well as biodiversity. Projects that make tangible investments in these areas through their activities and then monitor the impact one of the monitor the impact of these over time will have the highest integrity here. On biodiversity, it's important to always remember that by preserving typically native forest cover, Red Plus projects do inherently have highly positive ecological and biodiversity impacts. The highest scoring projects will be located in areas with particularly high biodiversity value and monitor wildlife on an ongoing basis. Although we score projects individually on their overall carbon benefits impact, we do also provide the scores for each individual one of these topics on the Carbon Markets Intelligence platform, splitting out, for example, biodiversity and alternative livelihoods impact. Thanks, Luke. And so the fifth criteria we look at after co benefits is legal and ethical risks. And these risks can really emanate from two main sources, the project developer or the country level. In general, Red Plus projects have a very wide distribution in how they score on legal and ethical risks, as shown on the right-hand side. And this primarily comes from the developer level. At the country level, corruption and political risks tend to exist, given that country projects take usually take place in countries where these risks are relatively high. But it's really, as I said, at the developer level where the widest variability in risk exists. Internally, we our financial crime assessments of developers screen all project developers against sanctions, watch lists, and adverse media databases, both identify and then evaluate 
any legal and ethical risks that might exist at the project developer level. And the very wide variability in the legal and ethical scores here really illustrates the importance of considering these risks. So we've now gone through a lot of the different integrity criteria we look at. And overall, I think what probably comes out is there's very high variability in the integrity of Red Plus projects. Actually, when you look at the average integrity scores across the 95 registered Red Plus projects we've conducted detailed individual assessments of, the average scores are usually in the mid range against when compared against the whole of the voluntary carbon markets. However, this average really masks significant variation that exists at the individual project level and at the criteria level. Indeed, when you look at this bottom row, so the percent of Red Plus projects that score over a four out of five in our integrity analysis, the picture is much more nuanced. Fewer than 20% of projects score higher than a four on either additionality or legal and ethical risks, while for quantification and permanence, nearly 50% do. So what's next? As we've hopefully shown in the last 40 minutes, Red Plus is firstly a crucial project type, but one that has rightly faced recent scrutiny given the measurement and design challenges it faces. However, this scrutiny has risked creating somewhat of a vicious cycle that threatens all Red Plus projects, even those of high integrity. Indeed, lack of trust in Red Plus has led to significantly lower prices. And this is for all Red Plus projects, really regardless of quality. And fundamentally, what this means is that developers and local communities earn less revenue from the projects, and therefore the projects can less effectively support sustainable alternative livelihoods that outweigh the opportunity costs. And with this incentive scheme working less well, incentives are therefore less aligned towards generating higher integrity projects. This can lead to a further negative spiral of lower trust and lower prices. And for Red Plus to work as intended and meet its objectives in effectively tackling deforestation, we need something in this cycle to break. And so now we'll talk about some potential solutions. Now, as you will know, um, you know, it, when we talk about solutions, there are a few things that we can look at going forward. So many of the things that we've already discussed in this webinar today sum up to what you could consider a Red Plus best practice list, particularly for developers. A list like this, of course, includes things like uplifting baselines within five-year cycles and using geospatial tech to validate assumptions, as well as pursuing jurisdictional alignment wherever it is indeed possible. Also thinking about permanence, like long-term permanence, 60, 80, 100 years. Ensure that the project activities are weighted towards incentives rather than just prevention. Monitor and quantify key sustainability or sustainable development impacts and find a way to communicate them. And be transparent on the benefit sharing agreements as well as their structure. And last but not least, make sure to involve stakeholders early and often, not least because science has shown that can significantly um, have a positive feedback loop on project success as well as permanence. As some of you will know, we are in the process of expanding our assessment framework to pipeline assessments, meaning we're now assessing pipeline projects that have applied for registration, but they're not fully registered yet. So what you can see here is the baseline scores, baseline scores only, comparing the current market average of the Red Plus registered projects that we already looked at to our first sample batch of pipeline Red Plus projects. And what's interesting here is that our sample of pipeline projects on average exhibits higher baseline scores than the current market average that we've been looking at so far. So maybe there is a slight trend towards increasing integrity in these new projects. Again, emphasis on this being a first sample. We'll con be continuing our work on, on this going forward and we'll make the scores available as they are finalized. Now, speaking about going forward, another potential solution, of course, for the Red Plus difficulties are the integrity initiatives. We have the international frameworks, many of which hardly need introducing, ICDCM, CCQI, Corsia, as well as the European Commission. Then we have independent third-party integrity assessment, MCI ourselves, of course, being one of them. And then there's an increasing number of independent data providers that want to help, particularly on the geospatial side, Chloris, Space Intelligence, and Planet being good examples. Going from the market-wide integrity back to the individual methodology solutions, 
we must mention methodological updates. Vera's new consolidated Red Plus methodology being sort of the obvious and most important one. You've heard it before, biggest shifts include the shift to jurisdictional baselines that are now set and published by Vera together with independent data providers. Then there's the retroactive application of the methodology for one of the old Vera methodologies, VM0009, as well as a potential voluntary retroactive application of this new methodology for any of the projects that want to receive CCP eligibility. And then given the jurisdictional baselines, also there is either convergent with JRED that the new methodology is working towards. Now, especially as first part, this new way of doing baselines has gotten a lot of interest from the market so far based on you know, what's going to happen to the projected supply. Using the extensive geospatial baseline assessments that we have in-house, you've heard a lot about this today, a first estimate suggests the market-wide project projected supply for, of Red Plus credits may drop by over 40%. There may be over 90 projects that stand to lose more than half their projected supply volumes. These are using our current supply projections. We're in the process of updating those projections, so those numbers may change in the future. And then the retroactive application of the new methodology may drop the market wide surplus of by over 25%. Now, it's 25% could be less if not all the projects transition, and it could be more if projects voluntarily choose retroactive applications for their CCP eligibility. And last but not least, in the basket of solutions, we end up at the other side of the spectrum for Red Plus, which is jurisdictional Red Plus programs. JRED is sometimes presented as a real quality alternative for RED, particularly for the overcrediting issue. And it is true that jurisdictional baselines could really become a game changer, but JRED is not a silver bullet solution either. Whether the integrity of your JRED credit is higher or lower than of a RED credit really depends on which areas of integrity you're comparing and which projects and programs you're comparing. So here, for example, an additionality, yes, the JRED baselines could be better, but additionality could incur risk if alternative governmental investments are crowded out and special applications such as HFLB may introduce additional risks. On the quantification side, activity leakage risks can decrease, but estimating carbon stock density over huge areas and many, many different forest types can become very difficult. JRED permanence can cope better with natural risks, but may be hit harder by political and policy uncertainties. And on the co-benefit side, a greater share of revenue may be retained within the jurisdiction, but the transparency to a decrease on the exact flow and share of that revenue. Before the end of the month, we're going to be publishing our new JRED projected supply scenarios for our subscribers. But as sort of a top level takeaway, we're looking, we looked at 23 registered and pipeline programs covering over 650 million hectares of forest. The estimate range of supply may be between 34 to 144 million tons a year, at least until 2040, that's on average. And you can see the widespread given the volumes that we're talking about here. But I've already mentioned you know, the idea of nesting Red Plus projects. So it is possible that not all of these credits will actually be available for corporate offsetting. Our scenarios suggest that there could be around 50% of the projected Red Plus issuances that are not available for corporate offsetting because they're already being claimed by nested Red Plus credits, by nested Red Plus projects, as well as NDC target claims. So we're going to have to see how exactly these scenarios play out going forward. Whichever of these solutions we employ and whether we employ all of them, the goal really is to create a more virtuous cycle for Red Plus with a positive feedback loop. So the greater transparency and project integrity leads to higher prices for high integrity credits. That offers higher revenue for developers and communities, and it really does make alternative livelihoods more appealing than deforestation. That in turn makes incentives more aligned towards higher integrity project and then closes the loop because it supports further transparency work on identifying those high integrity projects and credits for the market. I think here it's really important that we also revisit how we started this webinar today with the importance of Red Plus. All the work that we're doing, all the work that all the integrity initiatives and other stakeholders are doing in elevating Red Plus integrity. It's about much more than strengthening Red Plus as a project type in the VCM. It's much bigger than that. It is about strengthening the role and contribution of the VCM in protecting hundreds of millions of hectares of tropical forest. And in doing so, it's about the role of the VCM in preventing billions of tons 
of carbon emissions from these forests and sustaining millions of human livelihoods, both of which, one way or another, depend on these very forests to survive, to be protected, and most importantly, to remain standing. Thanks, Teresa. So we've now gone through our the presentation from the MSCI Cold Markets team, but we wanted to ask a couple of questions to you as the audience. The first of those is really we're understanding from you what you think the biggest concern is holding back your organization from Red Plus, whether that's investing or in Red Plus projects or buying Red Plus credits. Then think secondly, thinking about that concern, how likely do you think those solutions we've just been talking about will be in solving it? I'll just let um open the poll and I'll give everyone um 30 seconds or so to, to respond. Yes, you should now see the poll pop up on your screen and please scroll down to the second question as well. We'll give it a few more seconds. Now we see the results coming in. So does that surprise you, Tristan? Yeah, it's interesting. I think the first question in terms of the biggest concern, I think probably isn't too surprising. Clearly baselines is the biggest concern noted by the audience, although clearly over 50% of people have said a non-baseline non being their main concern. I think what is quite interesting is the second one on how likely you think existing solutions will be in solving it. Um, and it's, yeah, it's good to see, to be honest, a lot of confidence that people do think that some of these existing solutions will be effective in solving some of those concerns. Um, there's probably some interesting analysis we can do to cross, cross those two tabs together to see how likely existing solutions will be at solving each of the different biggest concerns that have been mentioned. Yes, very interesting to, to hear from you indeed, as you um, heard from us, uh, our perspective on different debate topics throughout the webinar. Uh, we have a few more minutes for uh, the questions. So um, looking at the Q&A, and I think we see some of the common themes around the CCP, Tristan. So I think the one of the question we get the most is around the CCP and what will be the effect of the CCP on the Red Plus projects and prices. Yeah, it's a good question and very topical given we were expecting some more announcements on CCPs in the next few weeks and months. I mean, I think first in terms of the price part of that question, I mean, we asked in a webinar last year what effect people think that the CCPs will have on prices and whether CCP tax credits will command a premium. And I think the respondents in that question said that the expectation was for over $2 per credit of a premium or a 30% premium that CCP credits would would command, which clearly given that we would expect CCP accreditation to be very desirable for project developers and um, the standard bodies as well. I think the difficulty of Red Plus is clearly the uncertainty over sort of which categories of Red Plus methodologies will be approved and when. Um, we know from the sort of key existing Vera methodologies won't be applying for CCP approval, but it will really be the new consolidated Vera methodology that Teresa talked about earlier, which will try to get CCP approval. And I think the question that then creates is then how will existing projects transition to that new methodology and how many projects will transition to the new methodology and how long will that process take? So. I think in terms of sort of the price premium, I think we have some confidence that there will be a price premium on CCP credits, but the big question for us is around sort of that transition of projects to that new methodology. Thank you. Um, another area that we get a lot of question today is uh, definitely on uh, carbon stock assessment with, uh, uh, we since we have Marco here, and I know Marco has answered a lot of question in the chat already, but perhaps just to highlight um, one of the topics that we get a lot is also um, a core around to what extent are developers using independent data providers such as Chloris themselves to 
mitigate key integrity challenges. So if you can elaborate on that, please. Yeah, this is start, start, something that is starting. Um, the availability of this kind of data is relatively new to the market. Um, but definitely we are working with a number of project developers uh, as well as uh, investors, aggregators uh, that work with project developers to help both on an insight side, so to better understand the project and understand what how it could be improved, but also this data can also be used in the actual project design in the, in the PDD used in measurement. But under most methodologies now, it does require the uh, combination of remote sensing and field data. So it's not a it's not a substitution for field data, but it reduces the cost and increases the accuracy of, of field campaigns for carbon uh, measurements. And there are applications like, for example, the, the new ERS uh, standard for ecosystem restoration has adopted our methodology as, as the standard way of measuring carbon in projects under the actual methodology. Thank you, Marco. Uh, in the two minutes left, I'd like to go back to Teresa. Uh, obviously, we talk about REST Plus today and we talk about JRED Plus. So we also have a question around that. Uh, do you think to what extent that jurisdictional programs or JRED Plus will solve risk of baseline overestimation, which is one of the biggest concern for REST Plus? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's something we're all looking forward to. Um, I think that jurisdictional baselines when done properly can have a real chance of battling the overcrowding issue. And resolving sort of sounds like the issue is going to be like 100% fixed and there's no way in which a jurisdictional baseline could go wrong. You know, jurisdictional baselines are not pulled off out of thin air either. You have to work with the data that you have available. You know, Chloris spoke to you, you have to work with what you have. You can see what you have available in terms of historical data. But am I optimistically looking forward to the rollout of these jurisdictional baselines? Yes, absolutely. And we'll very closely watch that and probably also create our own models of the potential market impact as and when it starts to play out through 2024 and 2025. Great, thank you. So as we already talked about uh, some solutions today, because we here not to only talk about debate and concerns, but talking about solutions. So Tristan, let, let's go back to um, what we have coming up on our platform and a little, uh, to give a little bit of idea about um, some of the solutions available on our platform for, for the audience. So would you like to walk us through that, please? Yeah, definitely. So. I think first thing to say, I mean, on the right hand side, we have a couple of upcoming webinars happening in the next few months. Um, our quarterly VCM in review webinar will be in on the 23rd of April. And then similar to this, another sort of a big integrity topic and project type we've been doing a lot of work on is ARR. And in mid-June, we will be having a webinar more specifically focused on that. But, but in the meantime, there's also for our subscribers, a lot of upcoming product enhancements that I want to um, flag that, as Teresa said, we're very close to launching a JRED issuance projection. Um, but also outside of Red Plus, there's a lot of things to look forward to. New Article 6 price forecasts, integrity assessments for IFM, improved forest management, as well as on the um, more CDR side, our forecasting team are going to be launching detailed costs and market outlook reports for BEX. Um, and a couple of last points, so our corporate commitments team and launching some new regulatory reporting solutions for carbon credits, which is particularly important and topical given how the sort of compliance element is changing in the markets. And then finally, we're also going to be launching a geospatial cook stove project development model. So yeah, hopefully a lot for our subscribers to look forward to, as well as non-subscribers through those upcoming webinars. Please do sign up to those. Great. Yes. So please um, follow us on LinkedIn and you will find a link to register for all the upcoming webinars. Uh, we won't have time to go over all the question um, that we received from the Q&A chat box, but um, thank you so much for your interest. And we hope that you find all the answer um, available on 
uh, our platform, some some of the insight that we feature on our platform. So please do give us a visit. After this webinar, there will be a survey popping up. Um, so we do really appreciate your feedback. If you could fill out and let us uh, let us know um, what are the topics that you'd like us to go deeper in the carbon markets. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you in our quarterly webinar next month. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.